Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation here. It is a great honor to have been invited, even if, if I, just like François Grand, am certainly not an expert on Tibet in any possible way. But uh, it may help that I grew up with a lot of Buddhism in Finland. My mother was a theosopher and uh, I was, uh, for the first time in my life, in a Christian church when I was 10 years old in a Christian country when my school took me. And I read Mahabharata and Ramayana when I was very, very small, when my mother's uh, friends translated them into Finnish. I have two mother tongues, Finnish and Swedish. I could choose in my country whether I wanted to go to school in Finnish or Swedish. I could also choose whether I wanted to have Finnish or Swedish medium university. And I thought bilingualism was a natural thing, it was a very positive thing, and I could see very well the uh, benefits, even in economic terms, already when I was six or seven, because uh, in Vasa, where I grew up, in the library, we could borrow seven books per week. I went first to the Finnish side and borrowed seven books, then I went to the Swedish side and borrowed seven books. So I could see in very material, concrete terms how useful it was to know both languages really well. Okay, I'll start, as you might see from this, I don't know if it if you can see it, but I have 79 slides for 45 minutes, so that's going to be quite a lot. If I speak too fast, I may forget, then tell me. And I'm going to first say what uh, the aims of the lecture are and content. And I'm going to read quite a lot of this, partly because I think that if people are second or third or fifth language speakers, as I am with English, it helps if I can both see and hear uh, the same thing. So, there are hundreds of models of education that are used for indigenous, tribal or minority children. And as you can see, I don't use uh, Francois' non-dominant term. I use minority, indigenous and tribal because these are legal terms. If you want to have some kind of legal protection from international uh, covenants and charters, then you have to use the terms that are used there. Non-dominant uh, language or a speaker, non-dominant language, is a non-starter legal. Uh, and I'm going to discuss the role of mother tongues in the education of these children in the light of partly how well the various models reach the educational goals and I'll tell you what I think should be those educational goals. Also, to what extent they support the maintenance of linguistic, di linguistic diversity on Earth, and also to what extent they respect linguistic and educational human rights of children. And I'll also mention a few models uh, for the education of children from linguistic majorities, dominant groups, and I fully agree with an earlier speaker who thought that, for instance, Han Chinese, whichever dominant group of speakers, majorities, should learn minority languages, not only other dominant languages. Uh, before I come to the uh, real aim of the paper, I'm going to tell you something about two types of background. And the first type is uh, disappearing linguistic diversity. And uh, here I'll give first a summary and then I'll go into some detail. Uh, according to pessimistic but realistic estimates, 90 to 95% of today's spoken languages may be very seriously endangered or extinct by the year 2100. And uh, we don't know about the fate of sign languages, many more of them may disappear. If this scenario is not counteracted strongly and immediately, the estimate could also be that most languages to go would be indigenous, and most of the world's indigenous languages would no longer be learned by children around 2100, or they could be completely extinct. The world's linguistic diversity is very seriously threatened. UNESCO uses partly these figures, partly more optimistic figures, about 50% disappearing, but uh, these are very realistic. Uh, since much of the knowledge about how to maintain the world's biodiversity is encoded in the small indigenous and local languages, 
And uh, we had some examples here, for instance, in your talk about Tibetan language and the natural world. Uh, then with the disappearance of these languages, this knowledge, which is very often more accurate and sophisticated than Western uh, scientific knowledge, which is acknowledged by several international scientific organizations now, this knowledge will also disappear. And that means that uh, destroying many of the, uh, that uh, killing these languages may also destroy many of the prerequisites for human life on Earth. And I'm asking, is this what we want? So this is one of the backgrounds. And then I'll say a few more words about this. Languages are today disappearing faster than ever before in human history. They, uh, languages have disappeared earlier too, but never at a, uh, at a pace that they are uh, disappearing now. And here I have something about when a language is endangered, some definitions, if it has a uh, few users, if it has a weak political status, and if children are no longer learning it. And uh, UNESCO has several definitions of this kind. And here I have those optimistic realistic figures and pessimistic realistic figures about uh, how many are really seriously endangered. There are also people like Mart Rannot from Estonia who thinks that we may have only 50, 40 to 50, maybe 60 languages left in 90 years' time, meaning only those which are absolutely fully digitalized, so that you can, uh, in 10 years' time, talk to your coffee pot or your fridge in those languages. They are the only ones which have some chance of, uh, of uh, being maintained. Now, many people say when languages disappear, it is the parents who choose. They vote with their feet. So they say, isn't it up to parents to choose what language to speak to their children? and what languages or, or language their school should be in. And I'm sure you know from Tibet also these arguments. Obviously, it's the parents who see that it is better for their children to learn the big dominant language, even at the cost of the mother tongue or mother tongues. <coughs> the small languages have not been able to adapt to the modern world. For instance, can you study computers in those languages? And they are useless on the labor market. Kids don't get uh, jobs if they only know those languages. And that is why these languages are claimed to be left behind. They have had their lifespan and they are giving space to more useful languages. And this is absolutely wrong in my view because most parents have no choice. For a choice to uh, exist, alternatives need to exist. Meaning mother tongue based multilingual education throughout the whole education system does not exist today for most indigenous tribal and minority children. They have to accept dominant language medium education. So it is not a choice for the parents. Secondly, parents need to have solid research based knowledge about the long term consequences of their choices. Most ordinary parents do not have this knowledge. And thirdly, parents need to know that all languages are fit for education, which is what you showed about science and Tibetan, for instance, and that either or is a false monolingual ideology, the kind of ideology that you were describing. Children can learn both their own language or languages if they have two mother tongues, like I do, and one or several dominant languages well, if the education is organized to make this possible. And in most cases, it is not. Uh, if you just think of uh, me speaking in my fifth language in terms of order of learning, and I had English only five years as a subject.